So our next speaker is Lance Dixon from Slack. Lance, can you share the screen? Yep. And he will tell us about lifting heptagon symbols to functions. All right, thank you very much for the invitation to give this talk. And uh, I'm going to uh, speak about something quite different from most of the talks this morning. It won't be about the uh, standard model. It will be about scattering amplitudes in <clears throat> the simplest gauge theory we know about, planar n equals four. This work was done with uh, Andy Liu and entirely under quarantine conditions. So <clears throat> the subject of this talk, as I mentioned, will be to look at how particles scatter in the uh, maximally supersymmetric gauge theory n equals four super Yang mills with gauge group SUNC in the large NC or planar limit. And the reason for doing this is because it's the simplest gauge theory we know how to scatter particles in. And the <clears throat> structure of amplitudes in this theory is very rigid. In any theory, you can kind of just as a mathematical fact, divide them up into a sum of rational coefficients multiplied by transcendental functions. But in the case of planar n equals four super Yang mills, the rational structure is, is understood extremely well. So I'll actually say very little about it here. And instead we'll focus entirely on what the transcendental functions are. In fact, we've learned that in <clears throat> simple cases, the space of functions is so restrictive and the physical constraints on these functions are so powerful that we can simply write down the answer <clears throat> at a given loop order L as a linear combination of some known functions, which are polylogarithms or iterated integrals where the number of integrals is just twice the loop order 2L. And uh, the unknown coefficients in this linear combination can be determined simply by applying some boundary conditions and thereby solving some linear constraints. Now at high loop order, there might be a large number of linear constraints, but still it's just a problem in linear algebra once we have the right function space. So <clears throat> the place where this has been implemented to the highest loop order in the case of planar n equals four super Yang mills are the uh, first non-trivial scattering amplitudes it turns out that two goes to three and two goes to two are trivial by virtue of uh, dual conformal symmetry. And so the six point amplitude or two goes to four is the first uh, case where you get non-trivial functions in the kinematics. And so we've been able to push this program to over the past several years to <clears throat> seven loops um, and uh, determine these amplitudes by only looking at the functions of the external kinematics, by playing around with the momenta out here and never looking inside these loops. So in some sense, this is the first step towards doing the whole program non-perturbatively because then of course you would have no loops to peek inside. On the other hand, at function level, this program has so far been mostly limited to six point amplitudes and I want to <clears throat> discuss in this talk uh, remedying that situation a bit. So what is the situation at high loop orders beyond six point? So high means greater than two because there's actually quite a bit of information at two loops with a large number of legs. But just for simplicity, uh, we'll talk about going beyond two loops and beyond six points. So at the uh, there has been a lot of information and clues about the right polylogarithmic function space to use in various cases. And particularly in the seven point case, as I'll discuss a little more detail later, we know very well what the kinds of uh, objects that should enter the arguments of the polylogs are. And those are called the letters of the symbol. I'll describe the symbol in a little more detail later, but the symbol of the three loop MHV seven point amplitude was bootstrapped using this kind of approach uh, <clears throat> like five or six years ago. And it was found quite interestingly that the 
it was more rigid than the six point amplitude. So actually fewer limiting constraints were needed. And this was done by James Drummond, Yorgos Papafanasio, and Mark Spradlin. So that kicked off that program. And then we found that with the Steinman relations, we could push further by using a smaller space of functions at a given weight and go to four loop MHV and three loop non MHV. But these uh, calculations, like the previous one and like the next one, which was four loop NMHV, were all done at the level of the symbol. And this <clears throat> latter one also used something called the extended Steinman relations. But the uh, program for the uh, seven point amplitudes has been stalled at the level of the symbol, and we would actually like to go to actual functions. Let me give you on this slide a heuristic view of what the polylogarithmic function space looks like. As you go to higher weight, that corresponds to more integrations. It includes functions that are classical polylogs, for example, not all of them, but some of them, with arguments that are some kinds of variables like cross ratios. At weight one, you have simply logarithms. At weight two, you have certain types of squares of logarithms and maybe some other variable related to this one. At weight two, you also have dialogs. Various integrals that are natural in this space pop up here and there. And then all of the different functions are related to each other by taking derivatives or more generally uh, what we call coproducts. But along with all these functions, there are certain constants which are typically multiple zeta values. And here you can see the first one, zeta two or pi squared over six. And the whole notion of, of going from the symbol level to the function level is all about where these zeta values sit. We'll come back to that later, but that, that's basically the uh, project uh, that we're trying to solve here. Now, why should we bother with functions? Everybody knows the symbol captures a large fraction of the function. Isn't that good enough? Well, I'm gonna give you five motivations. The first motivation is that the LHC doesn't measure symbols. Of course, you could say the LHC doesn't measure anything in n equals four super Yang mills, and you'd be correct about that, but you know, one step at a time. So <clears throat> to be more specific, you can learn a lot sometimes by plotting a function, but you can't plot a symbol. And we've learned in the n equals six version of the bootstrap that there are lots of plots you can make and they actually teach you a few things. For example, this is a plot that shows ratios of successive loop orders for ranging from two loop over one loop to seven loop over six loop. And you can see there's a lot of interesting structure in there, which I won't uh, focus on now. But in the case of seven point amplitude, there are almost no plots that you can find. You can find a plot of the remainder function for the seven point amplitude at two loops. And this was in a great paper by John Golden and Mark Spradlin but frankly, I told him to make this plot and he might not have made it if I hadn't told him. Well, he can answer that question later. But any, anyway, this is a great plot. And uh, our aim is to make more plots like that. So here's a second motivation. Many of you who read comics know that every superhero needs an origin story. You know, I was bitten by a radioactive spider as a teen and that explains a lot, but Anyway, so similarly, every super amplitude needs an origin story. And recently, in the six point case, we have uh, made a little progress on its origin story. In this case, uh, by the origin, I mean when we take the three cross ratios, uh, the famous U, V, and W that we use to zero, that's the origin. And we discovered that the story is that at least the bosonic amplitude, the MHV, has a remarkably simple structure. Instead of having two L logarithms, it has only two logarithms. And because it has a weight two L, it needs to have a weight two L minus two function of multiple zeta values or zeta values in here. And this was seen through seven loops 
in a paper from last year. That should be 1906, not 1960. But in the next talk that we're going to hear after the break by Benjamin Basso, we'll hear more about the hexagon origin story. And these zeta value coefficients, we think we now understand them to all orders and at finite coupling. So that's a pretty cool story, which you're gonna hear in the next talk. But we would like to know, how about n equals seven? Does the same sort of thing happen to the logarithm of the MHV amplitude? Well, the problem is, first of all, we need to find an analog of the origin, which is a little bit less symmetric because there's a gram determinant constraint, but there is one where you take the first six of the UIs to zero, there turn out to be seven cross ratios, but they're constrained so that you have to take the last one to one. In any event, when you do that, you could do it at the level of the symbol, and we can go back to this for loop MHV symbol that we computed a few years ago and look at it, and we can conclude that the MHV symbol is consistent with this. It sort of looks like the exponential of the one loop but it, this symbol gives us no zeta valued information and all the richness of this limit is in what the zeta values are doing. So that's another reason to wanna to know what's going on beyond the symbol level. Another thing we might wanna do is to study the near collinear limit. This is also in the right version of it, the operator product expansion. And uh, this uh, expansion was laid out to us uh, by Basso, Sever, and Vieira, but it would be nice to test it to as high loop orders as we can and to do it at the level of complete functions. Another limit that would be very interesting to explore at function level would be the multi-regi limit. There's a recent all orders conjecture for a quantity that appears in the multi-regi limit of endpoint amplitudes, but it first appears in the seven-point amplitude due to Del Duca and correct collaborators from a few months ago. It's a prediction of the central emission block. So we could test that if we knew the seven point amplitude at function level. A fifth motivation, final motivation is the coaction principle. I'm not gonna be able to say a whole lot about it, but we discovered in the six point case that there's a very restricted set of zeta values and functions that appear for n equals six. Just as a simple example, Zeta two is not independent of the other functions. And zeta three is also not independent. These uh, observations are closely related to ones that were made earlier in uh, phi to the fourth theory, the UV divergences and the electron anomalous magnetic moment by Oliver Schnetz, Francis Brown and Eric Panzer. And we would like to know uh, whether similar uh, principles apply in the seven point case. These principles allow you to predict structures of, in the function space or, or numbers based on what's happening at lower loop order. All right, so I've given you a few motivations and now for the rest of the talk, I'll give you a quick uh, refresher about iterated integrals and symbols. We're gonna talk about a very interesting surface that is useful in this project called the CO surface and uh, how we uh, end up fixing those zeta values that I mentioned. Actually, once the zeta values are fixed, fixing the amplitudes will be relatively easy, at least for those where the symbol was already known previously. And then of course, I'll show you a few plots and make a few other comments. So many of you know that iterated integrals are, uh, well, quantities where you integrate from one point to another multiple times. It's convenient though for me to just define them by their derivatives. The derivative of such a function is a sum over functions multiplied by d logs of some quantities sk, we'll call the symbol letters. They depend in a certain way on the underlying kinematic variables. This derivative here is also part of a coaction or coproduct delta. It's a specific component where we have n minus one, which means that this function has one weight lower than the other one. And this d log is the differential of a log. <clears throat> and these functions still contain zeta values in them. To get to the symbol, you iterate this n times until you get only a sequence of d logs 
with only rational numbers stuffed in front of them. In other words, when you take n derivatives, some of them are gonna, uh, the zeta values will all die because they are higher weight objects that are constants. So in order to see the zeta values, you need to go lift up from the symbol to these coproducts. So what are the symbols? Well, in the two cases I'm gonna refer to, the six point amplitude and the seven point amplitude, uh, these are all polylogarithmic, so they all have symbols and they're all made out of uh, projectively invariant ratios of uh, four brackets or determinants of these four component momentum twisters introduced by Andrew Hodges a while ago. And uh, so these four brackets are uh, manifest the symmetries very nicely. For the hexagon case, there are three underlying variables which we might choose to be called u, v, and w. I'm not gonna go into details about their definitions in terms of Mandelstam variables, but the symbol letters are nine, which are in some sense functions of u, v, and w, but they can also be written as functions of the, of the, four, of the four brackets where they're all uh, rational. So that was understood from early in the um, uh, construction of the six-point amplitude at two loops by Gontroff, Spradlin, Virgu, and Volovich, and then we used it as a principle for going further than two loops a little bit after that. Now in the heptagon case, as I mentioned earlier, uh, cluster algebras have provided a nice clue to what the right set of letters should be. And the conclusion validated by successfully bootstrapping symbols in terms of them is this. So there are six quantities here, A11 to A61, which involve four brackets, in some case, cup products involving differences of products of four brackets. And then you get the rest of the 42 letters by cycling the last index from one to seven by cycling the momentum twisters or the arguments of all of these. And uh, these are the AJI letters. There are also some things uh, that we call, that I call cross ratios, sometimes denoted with two indices, but for example, U1 would be A17 over A13, A14, and so on. Now there are seven of these cross ratios, but as I mentioned earlier, they're not all independent. There's a fourth order constraint on them, so there are really only six of them. Now I can't show you the six dimensional kinematics because I don't have a good enough screen for that, but I can show you sort of the hexagon kinematics, which has uh, three different uh, variables and it's useful for getting intuition into the six point case. And there are actually a large number of different lines that we understand from the six point case, um, but I'm just gonna point out there's the origin and another interesting line is this line U00. Because an analog of this line in the seven point case will be important for uh, efficiently constructing heptagon functions rather than symbols. Also notice that there's a, we could define a bulk region where we're strictly in the positive octant. So U, V and W are all bounded away from zero and a boundary region where one or more of the cross ratios goes to zero. When you're in the bulk, all the hexagon functions are finite. When you're on the boundary, you get logarithmic divergences as one or more of these variables goes to zero. As I said, I can't show you the whole six dimensional heptagon kinematics, but I can show you a two dimensional slice, which we call the CO surface because it interpolates between soft slash collinear limits and the origin. So the origin, so this plane here is where we take U3 and U4 to be arbitrary. They can run from zero to infinity, but the four of the other ones have to be infinitesimal, very small, and U7 has to be equal to one. And this is an allowed region that satisfies the gram determinant constraints for any values of U3 and U4, as long as these are infinitesimal. The origin is where we also take U3 and U4 to be very small. And uh, <clears throat> these limits here turn out to be uh, where uh, you approach six-point kinematics. 
in fact, you approach that U00 uh, line segment, which is on the boundary of six point kinematics. So the most amazing thing is that the symbol letters on this surface, this two dimensional surface are extremely simple. There's one which I show in gray because actually it doesn't really appear. The coefficients of it always vanish on this surface. And what you're left with is a very set of sim simple set of symbol letters which correspond to uh, just uh, single argument harmonic polylogs with indices zero and one for u the U3 and U4 dependence that sort of factorizes. And then uh, logarithms in the small variables one, two, five, and six. So basically this surface is two copies of that U00 line. But it's big enough that we can move around on it and do interesting things. Basso, Sever, and Vieira gave a nice parameterization of seven point kinematics and involving variables that behave well in the OPE limit. And uh, the momentum twisters can be written explicitly in terms of these uh, six variables. And the OPE limit that they considered first was to take these t's and make them very small, holding s and f fixed. But they also considered a double scaling limit where they make f big at the same rate that t gets small. The CO limit is sort of a triple scaling limit where you scale t, s, and f using epsilon in this fashion, so f gets especially big. And this uh, fact that there's a simple description of the surface suggests that maybe similar things will be useful for when we go beyond seven points. So now I should say a word about branch cut conditions. The way all these zeta values are fixed is, is because the functions that you build should not have any unphysical uh, branch, branch cuts in unphysical locations. And those would be associated with functions like this with zeta values times logarithms of symbol letters that are not allowed in the first entry, that are not these uh, UKs. And so these things are bad functions. They can't live independently, but they sit inside the derivative of, of physical functions and fix up other problems. So you need to fix these coefficients and the natural place to do it is near where these uh, non-leading uh, symbol letters uh, vanish. Now in the hexagon case, we did a, a route to fixing them that was sort of oriented towards the bulk where the functions were all finite. So we fixed the logarithms of one minus u at a nice symmetric finite point. And the ones involving logarithms of these y variables at the boundary, but then we moved the results back up into the bulk and uh, found some nice things about what values the zeta values could have. And so we were sort of living in this space inside, inside the bulk. The problem in the seven point case is we don't know of any simple bulk analog. So we have no choice but to work on the boundary. So we impose a set of branch cut conditions, which I'm gonna be very brief about, but there's this vanishing of the log one minus u7 on the whole surface. Then when we get near the lines u3 and u4 equals one, we, we forbid bad branch cuts there. There is one other one you can apply nearby. And when you've imposed all of the correct constraints, you find that, that all the zeta values get fixed. And so we can fully define the heptagon functions in the neighborhood of this surface. And by the way, we got a big computational assist because we knew this structure of the function space at symbol level through weight six from previous work. Now this surface would be useless if it didn't go anywhere interesting, but in fact, it intersects a lot of interesting surfaces. For example, in this earlier paper, we, we found that we should apply two constraints on the components of the NMHV amplitudes. I'm not going into much detail here, but the place where you would need to apply these constraints is a surface which intersects the CO surface. And that means that we can apply the constraints on the CO surface. And that's enough to fix all the zeta values in the amplitudes, along with using also the traditional soft and collinear limits. So it's actually no problem to determine the amplitudes once we have this function space. Now, let me mention this 
function which I showed plotted earlier by Golden and Spradlin. For generic kinematics, this formula has 49,677 terms, and 112 of them have a non-classical polylog L22 in it. Now we drop onto this surface, and everything simplifies enormously. These 112 L22 functions collapse to three pairs for which there's an identity, and uh, this more or less had to happen, but, but they all reduce down to classical polylogs. And so this is the formula that you get when you're on this CO surface. And so it's uh, quite simple. If we were to go to the origin, it would simplify even more. When you take U3 and U4 to zero, you find all these terms drop out except for these guys. And you'll notice that this is quadratic in logarithms, which is nice. There's also a diagonal line in this surface. Doesn't make a whole lot of sense unless u is also very small, otherwise the gram determinant doesn't vanish. But we can still plot the function on it for smallish u. And in fact, this CO surface in this diagonal is very close to a line that I showed you the plot for earlier that Golden and Spradlin plotted it on. You can see that the CO surface is almost right next door. It's very close and becomes increasingly close as u goes to zero. So we can actually compute any amplitude on this surface. We actually do exactly what Francesco Moriello was talking about earlier. We do a power series expansion. And in this case, well, we can plot it to the end of the positive region, which is out here, just by expanding 40 terms in the power series. And our boundary values, just like Francesco had a point at which he knew the boundary values, we know them at the origin because the origin lies on the CO surface. So that's where we fix the integration constants. And then we can recover the, the actual golden Spradlin function and do two more loops worth. Before I show you the plots, let me just mention something, which is that planar n equals four has a finite radius of convergence of its perturbative series, unlike other gauge theories, which tend to have asymptotic series. And we know that what the radius is for the cusp anomalous dimension, it's 1 16th. And that means that for the cusp asymptotically, the coefficients uh, ratio of successive loop orders is minus 16. And based on six point experience, we expect this magic minus 16 to be the ratio of successive loop orders for amplitudes at generic points in the bulk. So we can ask how close are we to high orders? Now, if we look at the remainder function, we find that here's this minus 16, and this is three loops over two loops, and this is four loops over three loops. So it's actually going the wrong way. So that's not so great. So we'll consider instead the logarithm of the uh, BDS-like normalized MHV amplitude. And now we see things trend in the right direction. So uh, it depends on what you plot. Here, just to prove to you that we have the three loop NMHV amplitudes, I show you some ratios of different components of the NMHV amplitudes on this same line. And the last uh, plot I'll show you is for the self-crossing surface. This is a surface in which the seven uh, gone looks like this. It looks almost like a four gone and a five gone, square and a pentagon. But in fact, uh, we're gonna work in the Euclidean sheet where it doesn't really look like this. And there's a four parameter surface that we studied before, so we can't plot it even in four parameters. So we'll look at two different one dimensional lines through the surface. In one of them, the parity odd functions are non-vanishing and the other one they're vanishing, but they both start in the same place at that corner of the positive region in the CO surface. And they both end in another place uh, that's also a soft limit. In this case, we can expand from both sides because we know both limits. And, but in general, it's, you can use a power series technique, although in at least one case, we have some polylogarithmic representations. So this is the answer. Here I've presented it in a different way. I've divided the remainder function, which vanishes on one end. I've divided it by the value on the other end, which is actually the point it's equal to the six point value at this nice symmetric point. And you can see that as you go from one loop order to another, the shape hardly changes at all. And uh, so 
things are fairly smooth in the bulk, which is a feature we've seen in the six point case as well. So I should wrap up. Let me just tell you extremely briefly that the co-action principle is kind of puzzling here. In the six point case, we found that zeta three was not an independent constant and it didn't even appear at one, one, one. But in the seven point case, we find that it is an independent constant function. But it's really shocked me. Zeta two behaves kind of as expected. It's, it's uh, not independent. It's attached to other functions like it was at six point. And zeta four is independent as it was. We need more data to look at things at higher weights. But so far, it seems like seven points and six points may behave quite differently with respect to the co-action principle. And just finally, just one lightning dive to the origin. In the six point case, I mentioned that the logarithm of the amplitude is quadratic in logarithms, and we suspect that's true to all orders. And in the seven point case, we can already see from the form of these uh, for loop amplitudes, now that we have them at function level, that they are also quadratic in logarithms through at least four loops. So it seems like seven points will have an interesting origin story, but that may be for another time. In conclusion, the heptagon function bootstrap is now well underway. This CO surface played a key role. We can integrate up along different lines into the bulk. We'll be able to check these various limits, origin, MRK, and operator product expansions, and study everything at full function level in a little while. And these similar multi-scaling surfaces may be very useful for more than uh, seven points. Thank you very much for your attention. All right, let's thank uh, Lance. Uh, Yara had one question. Yeah, I just wanted to ask, uh, do you understand uh, on which surfaces or in which limits the result turns into a classical polylog because some of the expression you showed were classical polylogs on uh, Lance, you are muted. Yes. You yeah. unmuted me? Okay. Yeah, I muted you. <laughs> yeah, so that was classical polylog because it was only at two loops. It probably won't be classical polylog at three loops. I have to check it. It's the fact that when you have a single argument uh, HPL through weight four, it's equivalent to classical polylogs, but not beyond weight four. But do you think in general, is there any significance of uh, being classical polylogs in this setup? Mm, not very much, no. no. Uh, well, I mean, maybe I'm wrong, but uh, I, I like to consider things in general that aren't necessarily classical polylogs. But I do think it's very cool that the kinematics factorizes on this surface so that it's just single variable functions. Thank you. Okay, we have a few okay. more questions. Let I ask a simple question, Lance. Yeah, Pedro. So could you uh, explain a little bit more? What's the geometrical meaning of this configuration, both for the origin and for the point one one one? Would you say a few words about the geomet? What is happening with the hexagon geometrically in those two limits? Zero 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 well, and one one one. One 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 is is very uh, regular. Nothing special is happening at one one one. It's not. There's nothing singular at one one one. It's in the bulk. Everything's uh, very smooth. It's some kind of a regular uh, hexagon, but I don't think it looks very distinguished. Now the origin is clearly singular, but it's not in a Euclidean region. So you can't think of it with actually, you know, real one three momenta. I mean, people who understand the, uh, you know, the, the cluster polytopes would probably give a better answer probably in terms of two two momenta but roughly speaking i think of it as trying to take a hexagon and making it into a, a regular into an equilateral triangle but you know that the triangles don't make sense for real momenta if you complexify them you can make sense out of them i think and if you take them to two two if you understand two two better you can probably give a better description i don't know if anybody wants to give a an answer to Pedro's question uh, that goes beyond that. Feel free to 
uh, two participants raised hand. But just one more. So, and you showed this region when in the heptagon, if one cross ratio was one, this was a self crossing uh, configuration, right? Uh, yeah, let's. Uh... So, if I do it in the hexagon, I guess if I take one cross ratio only to one, that's also a self crossing point, right? Well, just taking one to one isn't enough to make it self crossing. I see. Okay. You also, can you see my screen? Yes, yes. You also need these other constraints to be in self crossing. The self-crossing surface for the hexagon case is the coordinates is u equals one, for example, and v and w are equal. So, so that was as that line along the front face of the cube. So you can get to self-crossing here. See this line, this red line here? This is the self-crossing line. Now to get to an actual self-crossing, you can't be on the Euclidean sheet. It's very similar to the multi-regi limit. You do the same analytic continuation. You take u to zero, continue it around the complex origin, and then come out here. In fact, originally when we determined things at the multi-regi limit, we did it by first going to this point on the two goes to four sheet, and then carrying the information down this line to the multi-regi limit to fix the constants. So the self-crossing limit has an overlap with multi-regi, which you might know as the soft corner in the collinear, in the Euclidean sheet, but now we're on a different sheet. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, cool. So this, this point, you can draw it as a self-crossing configuration if you're, on, if you're not in the Euclidean sheet. It's a very symmetrical kind of one. There's a question from David. Um, yes, Lance. It, hi. Uh, you mentioned hi. the interaction principle in phi to the fourth theory in G minus two, and at seven loops in phi to the fourth and four loops in G minus two, we see polylogarithms of six roots of unity. Does it make sense for you to go to kinematic points at which you see six roots of unity and ask whether they're constrained by the coaction principle? Yes, we've done that actually in our paper from last year, mm -hmm. and referring to this picture here, there are points on this diagonal at one quarter, one quarter, one quarter, where everything is polylogs with sixth roots of unity, and there is a co-action principle. So because we have a function of three variables, we can find a bunch of points where there are different uh, polylogs. What we don't know is in the seven point case, we don't know of very many interesting points where we can see anything like this happening. We're still exploring that. But we don't have an analog of one, 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 where we can do sort of numerical uh, studies of the co-action principle. What we don't see yet is function level, is whole functions dropping out. So uh, it's, and it's kind of, as I was saying, a bit of a shock. Mm. Thank you. Sure. And uh, Matt? So, you mentioned that um, when you were looking at the uh, space of constants that you were only able to constrain them up to a certain order just because there's only so many coproduct components in the amplitudes that the loop order you had. Um, right. Did you also look at whether you could constrain those constants in the sort of bottom up way we did for the six point cases? Um, not, not uh, we haven't really looked at that. We should look at it more. So yeah, I, I don't know what the answer is yet. I, the top down was just easy to do quickly. So it's, it's a good idea, thanks. There's a question from Omar. Hi Lance, that was great. Um, so okay. you said that the um, coaction principle works differently for n equals seven to n equals six, and that's kind of expected. I mean, that's not being very shocked, uh, but do you expect it to work differently for NMHV amplitudes? In By the seven? way, when I say works differently, I should clarify slightly. I mean, I still think it, it works. It's just that if, if you fill out the whole polylogarithmic space, it doesn't really make any predictions for you. In order to get predictions, you need to see things dropping out or going missing. Otherwise, you don't learn anything. And because and the we rule seems to be different. Sorry, like the- I'm just saying the fact that zeta three uh, is there 
as an independent function. We, we know that it's contained, it's, it, it's contained in the span of all the co-products of the, of the three and four loop amplitudes. So we need it. And therefore we can't like conclude that zeta three squared is missing like we do in the six point case. So, uh, I mean, the NMHV amplitudes, they're part of the problem. If we just look at three loop MHV, we can attach zeta three to some uh, other functions. And three loop NMHV blows that out of the water and does, doesn't allow it to do it. So I can't remember if we did four loop MHV, we, we kind of did that after three loop NMHV. So, but I mean, the complexity of NMHV is part of the reason why we don't get to restrict to a smaller space, it seems. Thank you. And Dima. I just have a very quick uh, uh, question. Uh, are these points, uh, the, uh, the one, one, one point, for example, do you know, is that point cyclically uh, symmetric? Is it cyclically invariant? Yeah, it okay. has the full dihedral invariance. So I mean, even at the level of the uh, momentum twisters. So uh, in other words, yeah. Yeah. Well, yeah, got it. OK, thank you. OK, any other questions, comments? If not, then let's thank uh, Lance once again. Thank you. I'll try to make a Slack channel for heptagons if I uh, <laughs> can figure out how to do it. Let's do that. Uh, and then we'll reconvene at 3 p.m. Eastern time, so that's in 30 minutes.